Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's CC webinar live keynote and panel discussion session. And thank you for joining. We would like to thank to China Mobile International France for sponsoring today's CC webinar live session. Now I would like to pass on the microphone to Eric to introduce keynote speaker and panelist and moderate today's session. For audience, if you have any questions to our keynote speaker or panelists, please do use a chat box option throughout the session. That's all from my side. Over to you, Eric. Thank you, Aurelia. And uh, hi, guys out there. I'm delighted on behalf of the CARE community to have a keynote speaker, Emilio Gribo, with me from uh, China Mobile International. Uh, and of course, the panelists, uh, Ayotunde, Naveen, and, uh, and Marco. Um, today, we are going to discuss um, uh, the new business models to meet cable's future, digital demand, and uh, the role of the data centers in the region, hence to, uh, to meet the future demand. Um, we will start the session with a keynote presentation from Emilio from CMI, uh, and afterwards we will bridge this into an interactive panel session. So Emilio, um, uh, the floor is yours, and uh, please take it away, and uh, I'm happy to hear and to share what you uh, have to do. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Eric. Hello, everyone. I wonder everyone can see the presentation. Is all okay? Good. So hi everyone, I'm, uh, my name is Emilio. I'm uh, the head of uh, sales care business at China Mobile International France. I've been in the telco industry for more than 20 years working in most continents. And well, seeing the, the evolution in the usage of, um, of infrastructure and the raise of new services, which are more and more demanding uh, interconnectivity, but also computing capacity. Let me start by a um, little word about us. Oh, hold on. Here we are. So um, we are China Mobile International. We belong to the China Mobile Communications Corporation, CMCC. CMCC today represents more than 4.7 million base stations, serving 937 million mobile subscribers and offering roaming services in 264 countries. Uh, CMCC is also serving 781 million 4G customers. Now talking about 5G, um, China Mobile obtained the 5G license to operate a 5G network and started offering uh, the service in 50 cities in, uh, in China back in uh, 2019. Uh, in April last year, China Mobile built the highest 5G station in the world by connecting Mount Everest. And also, one year ago, the deepest 5G base station uh, that was installed in a coal mine located more than 500 meters underground. In July last year, China Mobile started offering 5G on the um, Hong Kong to Macau bridge as well. China Mobile has today 390,000 5G base stations and 173 million 5G subscribers. Now, uh, talking in more detail about CMI, China Mobile International, we address three main markets. Carrier with our iConnect line of services, enterprise with our iSolutions offering, and also end users with uh, platforms allowing users and users to roam worldwide, as well as make and receive calls at uh, competitive rates. Let me focus a bit more on, on, on our carrier suite of services, what we call iConnect. So iConnect is today traditional voice, also SMS services with a person to person, application to person, mobile services with uh, IPX and uh, signaling, and uh, data with everything um, that has to do with uh, private lines, with IP transit, with internet data centers, with content delivery networks, SD1, as well as uh, China Connect. On top of this, let's say traditional businesses, we also offer iConnect Pro. Uh, this is mainly um, a line of, of products and services dedicated to carriers, 
where we offer content, but also devices, power cabinets, as well as data clearinghouse services. And last but not least, um, CMI is active on the IoT market, uh, covering China and the rest of the world with uh, multiple approaches going from, let's say, the classical SIM cards to a full range of IoT solutions. In terms of, um, of our presence, we have a global presence with 37 offices in all continents and counting. So let me start talking about cable systems. Uh, we have a participation in more than 70 different cables worldwide. This is both terrestrial and uh, submarine. This represents more than 90 terabits per second uh, international transmission bandwidth. We have also built nine submarine cables and directly invested in eight terrestrial cables. All this backbone allows us to interconnect Europe with Asia through both terrestrial and submarine uh, cables, of course, but also the Americas to Europe and the Americas to Asia, as well as all the APAC region through multiple cable systems, as we see in the, in the map. We're also part of the Two Africa Consortium, uh, which will allow us to extend our already existing capacity, uh, which interconnects today the, the, the African continent. Regarding our infrastructure in China, we are one of the official gateways to and from China, offering connectivity over our terrestrial and submarine network via different points of interconnection. And well, this allows us to transit via the neighboring countries and all the submarine cables uh, uh, landing in, in China as well. This of course allows us to terminate the services from our catalog in China, but also to offer all of our customers the possibility to seamlessly interconnect their worldwide locations with China. And this for all kinds of services, including for instance, uh, Cloud Connect. And, and, and on Cloud Connect, I'm talking about connectivity between cloud services from all the major players. Um, still talking about our network resources, focusing on our data centers. Well, China Mobile has a long story with data centers. We operate more than 340 of them in China. And we have also built as CMI, our own data centers outside of mainland China. On top of that, we have developed partnerships with the main players uh, around the world in the data center world. Uh, today, we have in operation Hong Kong, Singapore, the UK, and the most recent one is Frankfurt. These data centers, of course, uh, added to the global partnership that, uh, that I just mentioned, um, are the base of our points of presence. These points of presence today are around 180 worldwide. This is um, a little focus on, on our our current CMI-owned data centers. So uh, uh, Hong Kong was the first one that we built, followed by Singapore and, uh, and London. Of course, all of them are connected to, to our backbone and they are all tier three certified and uh, tier four ready. If you allow me, I will spend a little bit more time with Frankfurt, which is the last one of, um, of the data centers that we, that we built. This is... Uh, the, the, the newcomer, uh, the Frankfurt Data Center acts as a hub for international network exchange, besides being an internet data center all in one. So this data center in Frankfurt is connected to the major Frankfurt data centers uh, in the city, as well to all of our European uh, local rings. And uh, uh, of course, uh, um, it is for CMI an import, a, a very important point of, uh, of convergence for all the capacity coming from Asia through both terrestrial and uh, submarine capacity. And, and here I can mention cables such as ERMC, TA3, TRA4 on the terrestrial and CMEW5, among others, on the uh, submarine capacity. All this allows us to offer connectivity to Europe, the Middle East, Africa, and Asia Pacific regions. And well, here again, we're talking about a tier one facility. So 
uh, let's take uh, a deeper dive in, in our topic. And I have called this first uh, section, a wired world. I guess all of you are familiar with this map. Uh, uh, this is where we see how connected our world is today. And this is only showing us the submarine connectivity. I, I, I wanted to make um, another slide with, uh, with a terrestrial capacity, with the terrestrial cables. But I guess the resolution of our screens uh, wouldn't be simply enough to, to, for us to be able to differentiate anything on the, on the slide. So today, all these cables interconnect countries, interconnect continents, but also interconnect hubs. And I think this is what interests us today in, this, um, in our webinar. Well, I believe um, we have all been quite sensitive to the increased internet bandwidth demand, particularly since uh, last year. We can see on the chart that globally 2019 uh, showed a trend of a, of a slowdown, except for, for Oceania compared to the previous year. However, in 2020, we see a substantial increase. So yes, the COVID pandemic stroke and, and, and our usage significantly changed. The 35% increase globally in 2020 compared to 2019 is huge. And, and well, we can see in this chart that uh, um, Africa and Asia uh, had the most significant growth last year in terms of um, internet bandwidth and trust growth. And well, all this seems to be just the beginning. Um, although, the annual growth should stabilize and, and even decrease, I mean, in terms of trends. Uh, the usage of internet bandwidth is expected to keep growing and at an impressive pace. Only in 2026, four petabit per second of additional capacity are expected. That's huge. And that's in five years. Okay, but where is this usage coming from? And how, would, how will it be carried? And how is it carried now? Uh, well, to cope with the uh, with in increase of demand last year, many carriers invested in higher IP transit purchases, in higher peering connect connectivity, in higher content uh, and content delivery networks, besides increasing, of course, the national and international connectivity. What is interesting is also that when we see the trends for the investment of content providers in submarine cables, their interest in increased capacity appears clear. We can see here how much investment is growing between 2019 and 2021 compared to the previous periods, especially in, in, in Latin America and for transatlantic capacity. So in essence, today's growth of bandwidth usage, is it just a matter of content? Well, for sure, content is there. But we also see in the very near future, and actually already now, artificial intelligence applications, as well as virtual reality, implying a huge demand for capacity in the coming years. OK, but where is all this capacity going to? It's great to have superhighways, but to interconnect what? How and what for? Well, let's talk about hubs. Let's talk about points of convergence. Let's talk about landing points. Let's talk about data centers. Data centers today is where it all happens. While, while some have been built in, in, in the large capitals where, where the customers are actually, others have decided rather uh, um, to be, well, to act as, um, as capacity lending positions. And this is to be closer to the, to the landing, to the, sorry, to the cable systems, whether these cable systems are submarine or uh, terrestrial. Um, talking about data centers again, while some remain carrier neutral, others are built by carriers themselves. In essence, 
uh, well, we see that the major hubs remain in place. I mean, we're talking here about New York, uh, LA and Miami in the US, the flat in Europe, those are there to stay. However, some others grow and keep growing. And we see two examples. I would say that the, the significant ones lately are Sao Paulo in Brazil and, and Marseille in, um, in France. Marseille has become an important convergence point in Europe. And uh, it will continue growing with the landing of the new cables coming from Africa, among others. As, um, as we said previously, uh, uh, the settlement and growth of data centers will be driven um, by different aspects. And, 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 and they will continue depending on the international bandwidth available, on their neutrality or not, on regulatory environments, surrounding ecosystems, and, and also I believe in, in a choice between being transit only or interconnection points. Well, we are of course all following the rise of the new data centers in, um, in Africa, especially in Nigeria, but of course I will let Ayotunde give us some insights on that. And I guess we should also keep an eye on Ireland um, and, and well, Ireland and the landing of all the transatlantic cables coming uh, and, um, and landing directly on Amazon, Google, or Facebook data centers. So we have spoken about the wired world. We have spoken about data centers and their different kinds. So what comes next when we see all the demands, current and future? What happens when we see cases like Singapore, where, where the land itself is starting to be an issue? I, I guess actually the, the, the Singaporean authorities have asked not to build more data centers because there is no more land. Um, and what is the role of the big content providers in the development of connectivity and points of convergence? Will neutrality prevail or will we see a closing environment? The interaction and the interdependence of cables and data centers seems quite clear. But what else can we do and, and how? Um, I guess the panel is open. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Emilio. And um, uh, thank you for sharing uh, the, 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 the insights from, uh, from China Mobile International. And um, um, let's see if there are any questions um, uh, in the chat box. I don't see some questions coming. So maybe I can, I can, I can check with you. You, you mentioned, Emilio, that um, uh, the growth is not just only the content and especially the, the the, 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 the VR and, and, and the artificial intelligence will play um, a role. How big would you, would you assume that uh, that role would be for, for, the, for uh, the virtual reality and the artificial intelligence in the, in, in the future? Well, I, I, I don't have uh, clear numbers on that, but, uh, but definitely uh, um, VR is a big, big consumer of capacity, of bandwidth, and of, uh, of computing space. Uh, how big will it be? Unfortunately, I cannot tell, but, uh, but it's, uh, it's a fact that these two application, AI and VR are, are coming more and more, and we feel them really taking a big place in, in, in today's infrastructure. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Emilio. Thank you very much. And this brings me actually to uh, to uh, to invite, let's say, the other panelists to the um, uh, to, to 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 this webinar, and um, which is, of course, I'm very honored to have uh, Ayutun, De Naveen, and Marco. I'll, I'll and I'll give them a quick minute to 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 introduce themselves and say something about their company. Ayutun, maybe if you would like to start, and welcome and thank you for 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 being here. Thank you very much, Eric, um, and great to be on the panel here. Great presentation, Emilio, and I picked on some points. I'm Managing Director, CEO of Rack Center. Rack Center is a leading carrier neutral uh, data center company in West Africa. We're located in Lagos. 
Um, we have a very dense uh, ecosystem, over 40 carriers, all the undersea cables uh, serving the Atlantic coast of Africa. The major ones are connected directly to rack centers through multiple carriers. And all the eyeball networks are in there, the growing ecosystem of CDNs and uh, other international carriers uh, as well. Um, we started in 2013 and um, I've been in Rack Center now for, for seven years. Uh, we've been growing. We just completed a doubling of our capacity to uh, 1.5 megawatts of IT load. Uh, concurrently, we're, we're also developing the site we have in Lagos um, to 30 megawatts uh, to come in live, uh, ready for service uh, and Q3 uh, next year. So there's a trajectory uh, there. Some of the information shows the kind of uh, uh, growth you have uh, in, uh, in Nigeria and, and in Africa. So we can talk about that uh, through the webinar. Uh, enough said, I think, and it's great to be here. Nice to see everybody else. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ayrton, and uh, honor to, uh, to, to have you on this panel. So let's go to Naveen. Naveen, the floor is yours. Once again, Emilio, great presentation. Uh, thank you, Carrier Community, uh, for hosting me as well in this uh, talk. Um, my name is Naveen, and I um, represent Tawasul Telecom. We are a, a regional MPLS provider in the Middle East. Um, you know, while I saw Emilia's presentation, I know that Middle East has always been a challenging market and we are one of those carriers who kind of provide the transit connectivity as well as provide, uh, you know, a complete leverage for carriers to enter into the Middle East uh, and providing a seamless yet carrier neutral environment. Uh, I look, look after the Middle East and North Africa sales, uh, as well as the pre-sales and procurement for uh, the Wasul Telecom. Uh, the Wasul comes under the banner of Kalam Telecom. Uh, Kalam is again a regional operator who has been growing both on an organic and an inorganic way in the region uh, of Middle East. So in summary, Middle East is our spot, sweet spot and we are trying to address this challenge of you know, the East meeting the West. We are trying to address that challenge as much as possible. So thank you so much. Thank you, Naveen, and uh, good having you. So uh, Marco, I think uh, you're the the last in our panel, but not least, so please. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you, uh, especially Emilio for this great presentation. Uh, gave me a lot of thoughts and I think it's a, it's a, it's a great source for our upcoming discussion today. Um, so, and thank you GCDSCM for uh, having me on the panel. Uh, I'm Marco, I'm from DKIX. DKIX is basically the biggest internet exchange provider in the world. We're currently up operating in 28 markets all over the world from North America, Europe, uh, Asia. And um, yeah, we have around 2,500 networks connected to our interconnection world. Um, me personally, I'm responsible for Middle East and uh, South Asia. So um, yeah, and I'm look really looking forward to do today's uh, fruitful discussion. Thank you, Marco, and then happy to have you on the, on the, uh, on the seat and the, in the panel again. So thank you very much for that. So gentlemen uh, and audience out there, we, we are discussing actually the new business models to meet cable's future digital demand and the role of the data centers in the region, uh, hence to meet the, um, uh, the future demand. So we're going to talk about uh, the consumption, the future consumption. Emilia already um, uh, tipped on it already. Um, uh, we're looking into, into new business models, uh, addressing the future market, market demands. And, uh, uh, and of course, uh, we'll step into um, uh, towards the uh, AI enabled uh, uh, autonomous data centers and so on and so forth. So please stay tuned and we're going to discuss everything you need to know. So um, um, Maybe Marco, I, 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 I start with you. Consumption of bandwidth is increasing. We all saw this and we all know this and it's only moving ahead and Emilio showed it us, to us again. So what are the today's and future data centers to meet the C cables operator demand and how can we address it? Now, I know you're from DKIX, but I want to have uh, uh, you to share your uh, uh, insights uh, from, an, um, uh, from a DKIX uh, point of view. Yeah, uh, broad question. <laughs> Where should I start? So basically, um, 
we see a, a lot of trends. I mean, the, the traffic is increasing. It's already getting boring somehow because it's just increasing for years now. I mean, it's staying this 40% and it's here to stay and uh, uh, just getting more and more traffic. Um, um, but the drivers are shifting. I think this is the, the important uh, news here. This is the important thing, what we have seen. Uh, AI was a topic today. And uh, while Emilio had his presentation, there came one thing to my mind that currently uh, in the UAE, uh, one of the biggest independent data center operator was bought by a company called G42. And what is G42 doing in, in the UAE? It's basically an AI company. Um, so, uh, what we see, and I, I see this, uh, um, I personally think this is something like, it's just showing a trend where uh, we see more investments, not only, everybody's talking about the investments from the OTTs, OTTs building data centers, OTTs building cables, but what we um, don't talk about is the next wave which is coming, and this is companies, regular companies are starting to build cable. I mean, Bank of America is starting to build a sea cable to between America and Europe, I think uh, from the East Coast uh, US to Spain. Uh, we see a company like G42 and AI side buying uh, and data centers and building data centers. Uh, so I would not wonder if uh, we, in five years, uh, we will see on all these events, not only the OTTs. Before we only saw car carriers, voice guys, now we see the OTTs and in future we will see companies there uh, or big enterprises. And I think this is the trend which we are approaching. Uh, everybody becomes a carrier somehow to a certain extent and an operator. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Ayatun, I, um, um, you also mentioned you, you, you are growing and, 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 and you, you're moving on. And, and as well as that, that, of course, we see that Africa is, is a huge booming market. Um, uh, so what are for you the, 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 the let's say the today, um, um, demands you you see and especially you know to, to meet the subsea cable uh, uh, operator okay yes um in one way being carrier neutral um we have a relationship with all the carriers and it tends to be much more very authentic because we're not competitors uh, competitors uh, to them um and um, we also seen, of course, I mean, we talked about to Africa, and we had mentioned to Africa being in that consortium. There's a corner also coming onto the continent. And when you see that kind of growth, even anecdotal evidence gives you a view that um, there's growth, okay? And therefore that's driving that investment uh, to, to support the trajectory of growth. And I think one thing is there to support uh, the other. What I mean by that is that you have a growth trajectory brings in the demand for capacity uh, for uh, data to support the data growth in the cables. And that's got to get processed somewhere, right? And so you tend to then you start to find that that drives the growth uh, in data center capacity. And, and also I think um, in the carrier neutral environment, you have all of the eyeball networks uh, in the same place. You have uh, internet exchanges that um, are, are, sort of, are growing and also being interconnected to localized data, get more efficient data. Then, so that, that drives its own growth. In a way, it drives consumption because you have people using a lot more data and you continue that virtual cycle uh, so far uh, of growth uh, anyway. In, in Africa, South Africa has been the real leader of growth over the last uh, few years. It has about 51% uh, of the whole total capacity right now in Africa. But you're starting to see growth really starting to uh, you know, come up everywhere. I mean, for the last seven years, we've been building a company, building a brand. Importantly, though, building awareness and building the, unlocking the addressable market here in Nigeria, but also working hard to unlock the addressable market in Africa. And I think we're getting to that tipping point now where the demand um, drivers uh, are really starting to, to, to come up. So outside of South Africa, you're starting to really see, just like you know, with the mobile telephony, um, Nigeria started to uh, sort of growth, hit the tipping point over the last 20 years. It's been a great example of growth on the continent. And that's bound to happen again uh, around data center capacity. You've got East Africa, that's Africa, Kenya, uh, increasingly Ethiopia is starting to come on. 
uh, Kenya, especially Kenya, you've got some capacity coming in there. Um, and then you've got the Egypt axis. So you've got some capacity points coming out uh, around uh, Africa. But finally, just one thing that's really going to drive the growth comes back to broadband. So you find uh, companies that, you know, satellite uh, companies bring in inland uh, um, uh, connectivity into Africa. You see, Africa is quite well served with broadband on the coast. I mean, for instance, we have every country on the Atlantic coast of Africa connected to one place, so in Rack Center. But then what happens beyond the coast and how you go inland? So you really are now starting to find, you know, the low orbit satellite technology coming in. You're starting to find, um, you know, quite determined uh, implementation of connectivity by companies like Liquid Telecom, uh, right through what I call the spine of Africa. So you're starting to now find that the consumption gets pulled uh, into the center of Africa uh, as well. Uh, so there are a whole range of growth drivers. I mean, I could talk uh, on, on a few others, broadband penetration, number of SMEs that, that exist, uh, for instance, continued internet penetration. I mean, for example, you know, Nigeria has the number five in number of internet users in the whole world, I think number five or six, but one behind Brazil, and it's on trajectory to go past uh, Brazil and a growing population. So if you look, that Africa's geophysical location is excellent because of, you know, in line with the sort of east, west, and north, south. So there are a whole range of growth drivers that will, the four petabits per second growth that Emilio talked about uh, has a home somewhere. Okay. Thank you very much, Ayatunde. Now, um... We mentioned that we're going to talk a little bit about our, our business models. Now. While the growth is there, and maybe Naveen, you can uh, you, you can jump in. Um, do we do you think we see new business models? And if so, can you share with us some some, some examples? Yep. So uh, Middle East has seen quite a few uh, a, a lot of difference in the last I would say five years, uh, and and moving forward also in the next next uh, five to 10 years, we're going to see a lot of difference. Uh, we are seeing some of the hyperscalers entering into Middle East, which was not something that we would have uh, you know, thought of at a point of time. Uh, AWS launching their first data center in Bahrain. Uh, now they have two data centers. We have Tencent coming into Bahrain. We have most of these gaming providers coming into Saudi. Um, there, is, there, is, there is a new wave of, I would say, the edge data centers. I think that's what's uh, picking up within uh, this region. So the need for coming closer to the customers have increased dramatically out here. Uh, and again, the, the, the driving factors is exactly what uh, Emilio highlighted, which is uh, there has been a lot of, you know, a lot of emergence of IoT uh, automation. And this is both uh, from right from the enterprise level all the way to the consumer level. You know, there's been, a, there's been a growth where people want to come closer to their consumers. Uh, the second one would be gaming customers. So we've just seen a, uh, you know, I think pandemic caused a, a wave for the gaming uh, community out in the Middle East. And, you know, there is, there is I think I saw a recent, uh, recent forecast where they're seeing it's almost close to 100 million gaming users sitting right here. Uh, so the likes of Fortnite and all are coming closer to the audience out here. So edge data centers definitely is one. Uh, the second, of course, hyperscalers themselves are building their own data center. Now they are showing, they have, they've been showing the interest to come into the region. And again, there are multiple factors. So first would be power. Uh, secondly, geographically, it's placed well. Uh, and most importantly, right now, there is quite a few of the governmental support that's coming across as well, uh, where countries are going into a cloud first policy. So these all factors are driving these kind of new demands for data centers. Um, and and moving forward, I can see that you know even even from a cable perspective, I'm seeing a lot of changes where cable providers are looking at new uh, new areas of uh, improving speed. Like for example, you know there's the uh, there's a new involvement of Holoco fibers, which basically claim that they they can bring the speed up to 50% better than the normal speeds. So. Middle East is I, I I can clearly see Middle East is a little bit behind, but we are picking up and and. Uh, I would say Saudi Arabia as a country is going to be a game changer in this whole, <laughs> in the world driving force very soon. It's going to be a massive driving force. Mm -hmm. 
thank you. Emilio, um, uh, as, as, as you tipped on it already, do, do, do you see, let's say, business models shifting, moving, you know, new things appearing? Uh, uh, and maybe you have an example for us? Well, I, I think there are different things that are, that are happening. Just as, as Marco was saying, um, the, the, um, the carrier market tends to merge a little bit with the enterprise market and enterprise users are, are more and more behaving like carriers. And as Marco was saying, either by building their own infrastructure, but for those who don't have the capacity yet to build their infrastructure, at least they are buying capacity just as, um, just as carriers were doing it before. Um, that of course brings a lot of new of new services, a lot of new stuff to do, a lot of new um, ideas and opportunities. Uh, um, one um, one example is automation, and and by automation I'm talking about connected house, connected device, connected everything. Now when when uh, when you're at home and you and you click at your smart lamps uh, uh, switch. Uh, um, or, or, or simply ask uh, one of the online assistants to turn the lights on or whatever. All that, uh, I mean, we all believe that it's happening locally and, 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 and we all think it's great to have a microphone at home that can light, turn on the light that I have next to it. But actually all this is, is going through cables to a data center and coming back. And, and, and there is some computing activity behind that. All that is generating a lot of traffic. Okay, when you, when, when you turn on the, 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 the remote control for your, for your lamp, well, it, it's gonna be some little bytes, but imagine millions and millions and hundreds of millions of applications like that in the world. It takes a lot of computing uh, requirements, a lot of bandwidth at the end of the day. So um, for me, automation is clearly one of the one of the big play. Well, one of the big topics, let's say, um, which are going to be using a lot of bandwidth, a lot of computing power, because everything goes up somewhere. I mean, we 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 always talk about the cloud. It goes to the cloud, yeah, but the cloud is not just floating over there. It is. Um, millions of kilometers of, uh, of fiber uh, terrestrial submarine, it's interconnections all over. It's uh, going through internet exchanges. It's uh, going sometimes through low orbit uh, uh, satellites, just as Ayotunde was mentioning. Um, but at the end of the day, yeah, it's all going to a, to a machine in a data center and consuming data, consuming bandwidth. Um, for me, that is one of the one of the new businesses that are, that are really demanding uh, uh, both connectivity and computing power. So Emilio, um, if, if, please allow me to, 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 to stay with you because um, I also as an operator, I'm interested in what, what you have to share with us and with, the, with, uh, with everybody out there. Um, the business models you, you mentioned and, and some other panelists also mentioned that you know, the enterprises are heading into, you know, you know that they're building their own their own data centers. So, do you see any partnering coming up? Is 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 that something? But what you see, let's say, as a, a as a model, is, is that something we see? And maybe after you, the the, the rest can bump in. Because... Yeah, yeah, Eric. Th th there is there is a lot of partnering. Definitely, definitely. Uh, uh, of course, many companies don't want to many large enterprises don't want to go out there and uh, and just open the pipes and just uh, open new facilities because it's not their core business so so the 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 first the first step to do that to be a little bit independent well uh, independent at least to have a lot of space to to do whatever they need is to partnerships so so partnering here is is a key but then what happens is that those partnerships evolve into independence and 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 that happens also to us as carriers because we as carriers i mean a lot of carriers have their own data centers but many carriers don't have their own data centers and work with partners and some some of the let's say small carriers have been have started working with um, 
with, with the big players out there in the data center market. And at the end of the day, they build their own data center because they seem, well, they need it. They need their own capacity. They need their own computing uh, uh, facility and interconnection point. So yes, partnerships are key, but I think it's, uh, it's also one step before build your own, build your own infrastructure. Nevertheless, uh, partnerships will remain there. Whether the partnerships uh, uh, depend on uh, geography, on uh, regions, on, uh, on, 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 well, some uh, common topics between carriers and enterprises, there are different ways to justify it. But yeah, partnerships are, are a key between enterprises carriers and data center providers, let's say. Okay. Um, Marco, coming back on the business model question for you, because um, uh, I, I know you like this topic. Um, um, partnering, do, do you see that happening? I mean, in, 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 the, in, the, uh, uh, in the IX world, in the internet exchange world, um, uh, I think you do have a couple of examples where, where, where these kicks actually, uh, actually kicked in as, as, uh, as being a partner, correct? I mean, definitely, because internet exchanges are basically based on partnering. I mean, the, the internet exchange itself uh, was developed out of the partnership of four operators uh, founding the IXP 25, no, sorry, 26 years ago in Frankfurt. Uh, and uh, nowadays it's even more, I mean, um, and we see this on, on a lot of fronts. Uh, I mean, when you operate in 28 markets, of course, you have different models. We are, in some cases, we are offering DKIX as a service where data centers come to us and say, well, we want to run this internet exchange. And even if it's a, uh, um, operated as a service in the end of the day, of course, it's a commercial partnership, but it is a partnership uh, where we also bring all our heart bleed into it into, in order to make it a success, right? Um, or also joint ventures and so on. And we even see that traditionally, of course, with operators and with uh, data centers, but even now we are in uh, contact with a huge enterprise who is asking us in particular to start an internet exchange in a certain region where they see the need, see the need for it, uh, for their own interconnection uh, uh, topics. Uh, where it's uh, basically about machine to machine interconnection. So um, there's definitely, I mean, telecommunication always was about partnership and it's even more in future. And when it comes to the shift of the models, maybe I think the, um, what we see uh, as we operate on so many markets and some of the markets were just a couple of years ago, like untouched or hard to touch. Think about India, we're operating four exchanges in India. Um, uh, services becoming a, a commodity meanwhile. So we are used to use services as a commodity as users, as end users. Uh, but I see the same happening now for carriers, for OTTs, for enterprises. So you want to have a connectivity in India, you don't care about it anymore. You just buy it, uh, you just want to have it. And same is true then for Vietnam and same is true uh, uh, somewhere in Africa, this is the expectation which is coming. And maybe this is the, the real model shift. You don't have this um, so much this untapped market where it's not possible or so hard to operate and it's too exotic and whatever. I think this is, this is a big change what we are seeing in the last uh, couple of years. It's um, internet connectivity, interconnection services are becoming more and more commodity and self-serviced as well. So you want to have mm -hmm. that on your platform, on your PC, from your home desk, as you can't travel, you Everywhere. want to establish your connectivity yeah. in the plane. <laughs> as well, as well. Thank you. Um, uh, Ayatunde, um, going, going a little bit in, in, in deeper into, um, uh, into Africa and actually generally on, um, um, uh, maybe you can share with the audience the relationship between the subsea cable operators and the data centers and the importance of it. And while uh, we, we think of it, I combine it with a question which we received from the, uh, from, from, from the audience, where we see that, that, that actually um, uh, uh, the, the cable, uh, the submarine cable uh, systems uh, are, are becoming a little bit more, let's say, um, uh, aggressive, as, 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 as they mentioned. Um, uh, uh, on, the landing, on the landing stations uh, with, the, with the data centers. Um, 
where do you see the trend is moving? And 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 once we see this, Naveen, I want to have your your, your position on this one as well in the in, in the Middle East. So yes. please, Ayatunda, you first, please. Okay, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll you will work a few things into the question, and I'll do that sort of try and cover it in the answer. Uh, from the business model point of view, um, you know, Emilia was talking about sort of Internet of Things, and if you press something, it goes into the cloud. Well. If it takes five seconds for that to come back, for an action to happen, it's the customer experience sucks, right? So um, you need immediate uh, response. And this is actually what's now driving new business models towards edge data centers, okay? Because you need to take away that latency and you need to uh, drive uh, compute toward, much more towards the point of use. So that's starting to take, you know, these huge mega hyperscale data centers from just one location in Europe, say flat and so on, uh, to distributing it a lot more across Asia, across Africa, and you'll see that growth. Now um, you have in data centers, you have a couple of business models as well, where you have a carrier neutral data center and the undersea cables, they converge at that, they all have their landing stations and they converge at that point because that's where you have neutrality, um, usually with an internet exchange. And then, you know, you get this ecosystem effect and you have, you know, some carrier neutral data centers uh, across, um, across Africa, but um, generally they tend to be the anchor points of real data center growth and capacity as we've seen in different places. But you make an interesting point about the CLSs. So you have some carriers who do build a data center business around the fact that they're a carrier. One benefit of that is that you're able to package sort of data center capacity into sort of the uh, transit uh, that's required and trade off and offset and uh, you know, offer certain types of services, which works. However, the downside of that is that if you actually need eyeball networks, is you're, you're closed into, you know, you're blinkered. And if that's your business and your business model, you need to get somewhere that gives you open eyeball network, carrier neutrality. So you find you have to get there. But if not, you can just stay in the same place and get the benefits of the carriers. And you have, you know, carriers um, that have landing stations that will also build data centers. I mean, in Lagos, um, you know, we have uh, MA1, for instance, that does that. Uh, we have also, uh, you know, one of the large data centers by uh, MTN, you know, they've been around for, for quite a while. And so there's a service that's delivered and a value proposition uh, around that. Now, um, with undersea cables uh, coming into the same uh, uh, location, you then start to find it gives choice. Even the carriers and that, yeah, that would have, say, the undersea cable uh, um, capacity uh, to, 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 to combine with the data center capacity exist in the carrier neutral data centers. And so there's an interesting symbiosis, actually, <laughs> in, uh, between both business models. Now, um, just another bit around that business model piece and some of the drivers in business model. You mentioned AI earlier on. You know, um, there's a lot of uh, pressure on, uh, of course, cost efficiency, energy efficiency. And if you're operating an environment where we operate 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 90% um, uh, humidity, and that's on a good day, sometimes you get 95, 95, 98, right? You need to be very, very PUE efficient, but that's, um, you know, power, power, power uh, utilization effectiveness, right? which means you need very closed loop monitoring in terms of how you can uh, be efficient to drive uh, at least at max, say 1.4 um, PUE, for instance. Um, the other side of that is we have to be sustainable. Data centers consume a huge amount of power. And with that sustainability becomes uh, very, very important. And one route to that is, you know, use AI, use what you need to manage cooling, to manage reduce power draw, but also you need to make sure that you bring in uh, a good mix of sustainable en uh, energy. The power you're utilizing is much more sustainable. And you see, you're seeing that shift in business model generally in the world. It's become a global issue. 
And just because, for instance, we're in Africa, it's not, we, we are really passionate about what we do with sustainability, uh, for instance. But I always say we need to look at the impact of data centers in the overall sustainability picture. Because we are, uh, six of us here, are not flying to the same point to have a webinar where 30 or 40 or 100 other people will fly to uh, to have that same webinar. So you have an element of sustainability there. So you find a shift or a balance between digital and physical, okay? That in its own way, in an interesting way, supported by data centers, but in its interesting way, in, it, in the total global impact for sustainability is actually more positive. Mm -hmm. So how is it, uh, to, to thank you, Ayun. Um, Naveen, um, how's the situation in the, in the, in the, in the Middle East? So in the Middle East, okay, now just to answer the second part of the question that was raised by you, Eric, in terms of uh, submarine cables versus terrestrial, you know, how, how do they interlink? Um, what's happening is, of course, uh, Middle East has its own challenges wherein each country kind of, uh, you know, acts independent. There's a lot of monopolization or duplization of networks. Uh, and, you know, the submarine cables have their challenges reaching to a specific location. There are some entry to barriers that I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure everyone is aware of. Most of it is to do with access. Most of them is to do with cross connect. Uh, and you know what's happening is there has been a boom for terrestrial networks within the Middle East. Now there are two reasons for this. One is transiting via Middle East terrestrially brings the latency down, which benefits a lot of data centers to host edges and re use these low latency paths. Uh, and the second thing is you know, most of the Middle East traffic uh, route through is Suez, uh, which becomes a common choke point for a lot of the cable system providers. And there is a need to kind of transit via Jordan and via, you know, this, by, via the North. There's a lot of need for terrestrial cables coming up uh, in the near future. And, and, also, and also what's happening is most of the cable systems are now getting owned by the hyperscalers. You know, the, the concept of consortium is, is, is dying out. You know, we are, uh, you know, gone of those days, yeah, gone of those days when it was just ISPs and operators. Now it's, you know, hyperscalers on number one and the rest. So there's a lot of hyperscalers uh, projecting, uh, you know, to invest on cable systems, investing on their own hyperscaler data centers, throughout this region in the Middle East and kind of extending its way through. And again, I'm just piggybacking on what I think they just told. And the need is because of a lot of digitalization, a lot of automation, you know, the, ma the market is moving into that forum right now. Yeah, I mean, interesting point because um, uh, to talking about investments, uh, and, uh, Reen, and I want to have a quick, 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 quick reaction on this one. I mean, data centers are being seen as a safe haven, you know, and, and, and resistant to, to, to the COVID-19 uh, crash. But the risk um, uh, profile, uh, is it properly understood? I mean, particularly by new investors. I mean, is there a danger of investing in the, in, in, in the wrong data center or whatever? Or, or do we don't care? Or, I mean, we don't care? Well, well, what's your point on that? Just quickly. Sure. So the interesting thing would be what makes a data center a, a, a wrong data center or a dangerous data center? That's the important point because uh, uh, the good thing is no now- power. Most... No power. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> no power. No power. No power. So most of the data centers now are built based on specifics given by most of the time the hyperscalers itself. They tell, okay, this is what I need. You guys need to prepare it this way. So and uh, in a recent study, you know, they've, they've clearly mentioned that data centers are the new GCC's oil fields. You know, this is, this is exactly what the terminology is. Uh, it is very clearly given that data center is a sector that should be invested on. And, and this, is an, this is an area that is going to keep growing. And, uh, you know, study says it all because look at, as I was explaining to you, look at, uh, look at how the hyperscalers have just entered into the Middle East market all of a sudden, setting up their own data centers, building up, getting land, so, you know, things are changing, job opportunities are changing. So, you know, is there a danger of investing in the Middle East as of now? The answer is no. I, mean, I don't see uh, it uh, ever in the near future right now. Okay, but, uh, and, 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 okay, so Middle East is, is, is on the safe haven, you say, because, because of the demand and everything is there. But looking at, at, at the country, 
where uh, Emilio just b built his the, the latest data set. And the power is the most expensive in the world, roughly. But they put there a huge um, uh, uh, tier three data center uh, there near Frankfurt. So um, uh, uh, Emilio, uh, are you happy with sp spending so much money and and talking about it? I mean, um, <laughs> is it is it a safe investment for for you and then and 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 uh, and then CMI? Uh, well, fortunately, it was not my own money. No, uh, definitely, it is a, a very interesting investment, and um, and 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 well, we see that the the demand is um, is huge. So yes, of course, power is is not the cheapest. Uh, um, but uh, but what we saw was that there was um, a real need for additional capacity for additional um, convergence in. Um, in um, in Frankfurt, especially for for us as China Mobile. So of course, we need uh, our own data center for our own activity because we're also coping with uh, uh, our mother company with CMCC and all their their business requirements. So I would say that that is the first layer, and 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 we need to have a, a strong network. And on top of that, of course, we have um, a big demand for capacity and the. Uh, and, and yeah, we have all been quite amazed by uh, by the interest from uh, from this um, from this data center. To, to respond to your previous question, Eric, about um, a bad data center or a bad investment, I think um, well, there is no bad investment today. It's like uh, investing in in uh, you know. Uh, uh, in, in land, it, it's there to stay. Then, of course, what matters is to whom you're connected, how you are connected, and of course, who's going to be there. But usually, if we build it, they will come. I, I guess you remember the the movie. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Emilio. Um, just switching quickly because we were running to the end, guys. Quickly to Marco, because on the IX and. Uh, and, and on the uh, on the peering, I would, would really like to 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 tip on one thing, um, uh, Marco. How 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 can you guys um, uh, help to generate new value added services to drive uh, growth and maximize uh, the, the the revenues to to all the other guys? I would I would I would say something to answer your question. Where is a bad place to for a data center? It's basically a place without connectivity. Uh, because power price is only important for uh, or, or let's say. Uh, when it comes to connectivity or power price, connectivity will beat power price for most of, of the applications. That's uh, for sure. Uh, because uh, without the good connectivity, without latency, most of the uh, new and future um, applications are not running. I mean, if you do Bitcoin mining, well, yeah, it's all about power. I uh, don't know if this is super sustainable and it doesn't matter where it is. You can do this in the Arctic and I'm not sure if this is has, perfect. For a lot of people, it has been over the last couple of two years. <laughs> yeah, and, you but know. you know what I mean. Uh, it's um, of course. For most of the applications, well, it's more about the connectivity and this is exactly the value which we can bring. Um, there was a, a question earlier on the chat about um, if um, uh, the data centers will be the new cable landing stations, yeah, if I would so. translate it roughly. Uh, uh, and yes, uh, basically the cable landing stations as such are dying in a case that most of the data the cable landing stations or the KSC cables are landing in data centers or CLS are built as data centers. And what it's all about, it's about the connectivity in the end of the day. And uh, what an IX speed then does is, well, if look at Frankfurt, I don't know, we have 40 data centers now in Frankfurt. Uh, look at Mumbai, uh, we're talking about 20 data centers, meanwhile, and they built like crazy there. Uh, so, and then IXB is connecting all of that and making the interconnection platform on top of it, uh, where in the end of the day, everybody is benefiting. Uh, every carrier, every, every data center, because this is exactly what the IXP is for. It's the interconnection hub in the, in, the, in the metro area, more or less. And that's the added value. And that's the, let's say, the, the surrounding thing for the, for the uh, local economy there, for the digital okay. economy. Okay. And that, 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 that's, that, that's how um, uh, to, to drive growth and then to maximize the, 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 the revenues. Staying with you, as um, uh, what do you think about the future? Well, what's there to expect within our scope? What do you see coming? Uh, Your glass bowl. 
<laughs> the glass <laughs> ball. <laughs> well, uh, in well, I can I can I can speak for 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 Dikix. I definitely can see that Dikix will operate on all continents all over the world. Uh, we identified 40 major hubs uh, for the future worldwide, where we definitely want to operate, uh, and a lot of edge nodes. Uh, we will see many, many more data centers and even small data centers in towers, in mobile towers, uh, like uh, one rec data center for certain applications which are latency sensitive. And we will see. Uh, I remember when Bill Gates had information at your fingertips, uh, maybe 25 years ago when they invented Windows 95. So I think we will see interconnection at your fingertips more and more in future. So it will be no question. I need a connectivity layer two from my place now to Australia. I go online and I will get it. Perfect. Cool. Thank you. Uh, I don't know. Do you have any some, some, some famous last words for us? Yeah, I think it, the world it becomes an on-demand world. But just very, very quickly, I think you'll find technology that makes compute to data ratio. Uh, people are talking about graphene and so on and so forth come in uh, and think, okay, well, that will just reduce data center demand. I think it won't, actually. I think it'll make it more realistic because we can't just start, we'll plant, you know, plaster the entire planet with data centers. The more we get the efficiency, you get the balance of growth you know, and technology that bring, be able, is able to you know, process and consume much more data with a lot more happening with AI, AI on demand, IoT competing at edge. And um, that demand, you know, driverless cars and a lot of things like that you know, will start to become normal, but not at the expense of exploding the whole world with data centers and submarine cables, right? How quickly that happens, um, it's, it's difficult, it's difficult uh, to tell uh, how quickly these things uh, unlock. But I see a trajectory in that direction. But in Africa, from an Africa point of view, a significant growth in data demand and also in uh, a data center infrastructure at, at the edge. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Ayatun. Um, Naveen. Uh, from your point of view, uh, what will did the future bring us? Tell us. I think the future has already brought us extremely close digitally. But uh, from, from Tawasul or Kalam's perspective, again, we, uh, we will be focusing on our horizontal and vertical uh, you know, consolidations. Uh, we have been doing a lot of inorganic growth with acquisitions. We're trying to, instead of, you know, instead of going and inventing something new, we don't want to reinvent the wheel, we just kind of consolidate. Uh, that's that's on the uh, on the carrier front, but from a from a technology perspective, if I look at a future, especially from a data center perspective, I would I would be happy if data centers focus on renewable energy to kind of run their data centers. I don't know, find ways to use AI based cooling systems. Uh, it could be you know reuse the heat in the data center. So th I think the world needs to you know kind of look at these angles in terms of data center because data center business is booming right now. So this is my whole perspective of uh, where we're going now. Okay, thank you. Emilio, the floor is yours for the last, last, last famous words. Where do you see the future will, uh, will come and how will it hit us? Well, I think for, for many years, uh, the last mile has been the topic. For many years, all of us uh, around here have suffered from that famous last mile, whether it is at the office, whether it is to serve one of our customers, whether it is at home. I think that point is little by little being covered in different areas of the world. So uh, nowadays we have um, fiber at home. We have uh, this low orbit satellites uh, offering us connectivity. Uh, more and more constellations of satellites are, are available up there. So. So I, I guess the, um, the last mile is settled. During this uh, great exchange with all of you, we spoke also about submarine capacity and uh, terrestrial capacity data centers. So let's say the backbone is there. I think, of course, we need more capacity. Capacity is growing, demand is growing. We need 
but I think the, 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 um, we, we already have something solid in terms of backbone. So the future should be now maybe the middle mile, because maybe that's where, where there is something missing. And what I mean by the middle mile is, is exactly interconnection, is making uh, latency shorter, is avoiding to go all around the world, to, to all over the world to look for something. Of course, cloud is there to, uh, today for that, but um, but we would be looking at that middle mile. And 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 on the middle mile, the interesting thing is that both um, uh, uh, cable, submarine, and um, and terrestrial have a role to play, but also data centers have a role to play. So um, so uh, we should keep an eye on that. And I think it's uh, it's a concept that uh, we're going to be mentioning a little bit in the in the near future. Thank you very much, Emilio. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, it seems that we are heading towards, uh, or we are actually at the end of, uh, of, of this, uh, this, this webinar session. Uh, I would like to a special uh, thanks for, for, for your keynote speak, um, Emilio, and of course the sponsor, uh, uh, China Mobile International, and uh, for your participation and, uh, and giving interesting presentation. Uh, and of course, to our uh, valuable uh, panelists, Ayutunde, Naveen, and Marco, Thank you so much for, for, for being with us and sharing your thoughts and ideas and, uh, and wisdom actually uh, around the world together with the CARE community. And uh, now for me, guys, it's, it's time to give back the mic to my colleagues in the studio in Berlin. So uh, Aurelia, it's over to you. Thank you very much. Ciao for now and see you next time, guys. Stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. See you sometime uh, soon. Thank you. <laughs> Dear all, we are at the end of this webinar session and I would like to thank uh, our keynote speaker, Emilio, for his interesting presentation, our panelists for sharing their knowledge with us. Also, thank you to the audience for participating and listening. This panel will be soon available to watch on the CC Media portal. We are looking forward to welcoming you at both with virtual and physical events this year. Please visit our events portal for more information. If you are interested in supporting and sponsoring one of our future branded webinars, please contact CC team. For all the updates and fresh content, follow us on social media. Also subscribe to our Telegram news channel to receive exclusive invitations to our upcoming CC webinar live sessions. Stay safe and healthy. Goodbye. Yeah.